Let's talk about copy machines for a minute. When you make a copy of a document, you have an original copy. That first copy is called the first generation. Whether you make one copy or a thousand copies, they are all first generation copies and they look exactly alike. Now, if you lose the original for some reason, you start making copies from the first generation, you now have a second generation copy. Now, if you lose the original and the first generation copy and start using second generation document to make copies, you're gonna have a third generation copy. And it goes on and on and on from there. Let's say one day someone puts a check mark on your third generation copy, and then you start using that as your original. All documents going forward will have a check mark, and everyone will assume it's always been there. Let's say your child draws a ball on a fifth generation document, and you start using that as an original. All documents going forward will have that check mark and a ball, and people in future documents will assume that has always been there. Well, then the neighbor draws a picture of his dog on your fourth generation document, and you start using that as an original. All copies going forward will have dogs. I think you get the point. After a while, you can have multiple copies of the same original document looking different, feeling different. A big issue with the analog copiers was the further you got away from the original document, the weaker the new copies became. The image became fuzzy, lines were not clean, it became a compromised image. Now let's translate that to the church world. Christians are disciples of Jesus who are called to make more disciples of Jesus. A disciple is basically a copy of Jesus. We try to live like him, try to talk like him, look like him, act like him, and in turn, we're to make more disciples, more copies who live like him, talk like him, act like him, who will make more disciples, who will make more disciples, and so on and so forth until Jesus comes back. There are lots of generations of copies of Jesus out there. The problem is, over the years, we've made so many additions and subtractions from what the original disciples look like that sometimes it is difficult to know what exactly are we supposed to look like and act like as disciples of Jesus. So in this series, we're going to look back and look at the first generation disciples, the very first believers who were taught by the original disciples. And we're gonna learn how to be first generation disciples. We're gonna to try to cut through all the centuries of additions and subtractions. The goal will be to remove the things that were never intended to be there and to add back in things Jesus clearly wants in our lives. Our text for this series is Acts 2, 41 through 47. For those who accepted the, his message were baptized and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as they had need. Every day they devoted themselves to the meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. All right, so we're going back to the very beginning, looking at the first original disciples, the first generation disciples, uh, wanting to duplicate what they did. We're not saying anybody else is right or wrong, and that's not the issue. We're just looking back and saying, let's just go back to the original. And that's, that's what we want to do here at Pathway. Last week, we looked at two different topics that uh, were part of the original disciples. First, they accepted the message. Uh, Peter gave this message uh, that they had sinned, uh, they had killed the Son of God, um, you know, they, they were guilty, and, and uh, they accepted that. They said, well, you're right. They accepted Jesus was the Messiah. That was part of his message, that he's the Son of God. Uh, they accepted the message of Peter about about Jesus. And then secondly, we looked at the fact that they were baptized. There were 3,000 that day that was baptized. Today, we'll look at the third attribute of these first generation disciples. And it says they were added to the church. In verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 people were added to them. Now, it's kind of interesting if you look into the original writing uh, Greek uh, of this text, it doesn't say who they were really added to. It just says that 3,000 were added. 
And so the translators, uh, as they look, you know, translate into English or whatever language, have to look at the context and try to decide what added to who, added to what. I mean, what, what does it mean here? And just for fun, I, I kind of went down a rabbit trail uh, this past week. I looked at 61 different translations to see how the different, 61 different Bibles uh, translated this verse. What did they did with that, that question? Well, who added to who? Who were they added to just as they were added? What, is it, what does that mean? 17 of the Bibles said that, that uh, they added 3,000 souls that day. doesn't say to what, just they added. They, they were just added. Usually if you're doing a math problem, you're adding it to something. Well, adding it to what? You know, it just says uh, added. Uh, 12 Bibles say it was added to them in the context of the, the original 120 that were waiting for Jesus and, and then everything that happened in Acts chapter 2. Uh, nine Bibles said that they were just added. I probably could have included that in, in the, the first 17 above, but the word souls kind of threw me off, so I separated them. Uh, eight they said they were added to the body of believers. Uh, some said to their number. Some to, said to the church, uh, being the, the body of Christ. It was, there was only one church at that point. There was, there was 120 people. That was it. That was the, the very early beginning. Uh, two said to their community. Uh, two, uh, one said to their followers, uh, to the disciples. Some said... Uh, uh, the message said that, that 3,000 signed up that day. And the message has always has to be odd, you know. Uh, get all flowery. Oh, 3,000 signed up that day for the church. So that's how they said it. <clears throat> and then uh, two said that they were just simply were baptized. This news added at all. Uh, because uh, the context, they, they didn't want to decide for us. And, and, and so those, those two didn't say anything. Uh, basically, in a nutshell, I mean, it's not overcomplicated. Uh, they were added to the kingdom of God. They were added to the church, the body of, of, of Jesus Christ. The original Jerusalem, 120 disciples who had gathered there, waiting for instructions, waiting for Jesus to, what's good, this power on high is going to come. They don't know what that even means. And then Pentecost happened, and, and, and Peter got up and preached, and this is kind of the conclusion of all of that, that 3,000 people accepted the message, they were baptized, and then they were added to the numbers. So you had 120, now you have 3,120, and now that's the church. The church has grown that much in, in one day. Uh, this is a very a generic time in, in history for the church. There's no brand names on anything. There is no Catholic church. There is no Pentecostal church. There is no Baptist church. There's no Lutheran church. There's no non-denominational church or whatever. Insert your brand of your choice. It doesn't matter. It was just the church. It was just people who, who believed in Jesus Christ, who said, yes, I'm in. I accept the message. I've been baptized. All right, now I'm in. And it was, it was the church. Over the years, we're the ones who kind of complicated things. It's the copy thing, as I was trying to communicate in that video. It is, is we, we start referring to other eras and time and history and traditions and things as opposed to just the, the original um, disciples in the very beginning, which is why we're doing this whole, whole series. People have uh, asked me through the years, well, what, what kind of church is his pathway? It's like, what are you really, you know, like, what, what, what brand are you? I don't know what a pathway is. I said, well, we made that name up in our basement uh, with a group of people that were hanging out trying to make up a name because we didn't want any baggage. We didn't want any brand uh, name uh, attached to us because uh, my answer is always, well, we're just a church. We're just, we just, we just a church, right? We, we, we believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We believe that we are sinners desperately in need of a salvation. We believe we are saved by the grace of God, that, that through his death, burial, and resurrection, we are saved and, and our sins are, are, are cleansed by, by his blood. Uh, we're not connected with a particular denomination. We are loosely connected with the Church of Christ Christian Church Brotherhood, but the whole point of that brotherhood is that none of us want to be connected. So we're connected to a group who doesn't want to connect. You know, So it's like they're all out there, and they have similar names and some not, but um, similar doctrines and some not. I mean, there's, there's, there's no hierarchy in this organization out somewhere. Uh, we're just connected through the bond of our common faith in Jesus Christ. And that, that, that's it. It's, it's kind of like how the early church really was, as far as I can tell. Uh, so there's no corporate office. There's no uh, convention that, that assembles together to vote on things and, and, and hand down official doctrine or uh, official stances on particular issues. We don't vote with other congregations on, on how we approach things. The Bible is our only source uh, for doctrine. Uh, now, personally, I really like that. I'm drawn to that, which, well, obviously I started the church. So that's, that would be what I'd do, right? 
But because the deal is, I don't want to spend all my time in the political things of the church in, in the world. I just don't want to mess with that. I don't want to worry about what position the higher-ups are going to come down on. And, and oh, oh, we've had centuries of teaching this, but suddenly we changed our mind. We're going to do this now. I just don't want to play that game. I just want to tell people about Jesus. You know? I, just, I just want to teach the Bible and say, here's what the Bible says. Now, now let's, let's go ahead and do that. You know? and, and so that's why we're a, a non-denominational type of church. Uh, the idea is we just go back to the original text and do what it says and act how how it says to act and, and live the Jesus kind, kind of way. So when we talk about uh, being added today, as they mention here in, in uh, Acts chapter 2, we're talking about it on two different levels. Two different levels. Um, first of all, they're, they're just ad- they're just become Christians. They became Christians. They were added to the body of Christ. Like I said earlier, they, they, they became part of the church. Uh, worldwide church, which was currently in one spot. <laughs> um, as scattered, it make, that makes more sense. But the, that's, that's the important part. Uh, it's the essence of what happened here was that 3,000 people entered the body of Christ that day. Uh, secondly, when we're talking about uh, uh, adding, being added today, we're going to look particularly at this particular body, uh, Pathway Church, because I don't have uh, any bearing on what's going on with the church down the road or across town or across the nation or even in Africa where we planted a church. I mean, I don't know what's going on there. Uh, what we do know what's going on on here. This is our family. This is our home. This is, you know, our little TV screen says, welcome home. That was on purpose. It wasn't like a, oh, look at the cute picture. It was like, no, really, this is home. This is family. This is what we do. So the two levels being added to the church, Jesus Christ, Christianity, becoming a disciple, and this particular body, a path, pathway church. That's the two levels we'll look at this today. Uh, you can be in a growing, thriving uh, relationship with Christ, a growing Christian somewhere else. I mean, you can. Uh, this just happens to be the one we call home. So that's what we're going to talk about uh, today when you talk about being added. Uh, we have two upfront goals for everybody. And I uh, just want to be honest, you know, there's no, no sly, underhanded movement here. We have two goals. Number one, it was we want you to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's, that's everyone uh, we can reach. We want everybody to know Jesus, and, and we want to be in heaven with them forever. That, that, that's, that's number one goal. The second goal is we want you to call Pathway Church home. Okay? Uh, I mean, and it's not because, oh, we need more people in seats, or we need bigger budgets, or we need bigger programs. It's because, well, we think we have a pretty cool family here. Uh, we, we, think we, have, we have something good. We've got some solid people here. Um, and, and we have some good stuff going. Are we perfect? No, no, no church is. Uh, but, but, but we're cool. We're all right. We're all right. Um, and, and so we want to be called Pathway Church Home. I learned a long time ago um, that, that the church is built on relationships. I mean, you can have uh, the greatest music uh, that there is. You can have most dynamic preaching out there. You can have solid biblical doctrine at the core of your church. You can have great leaders in all areas of the ministry. But if people don't like each other, if there's no relationships being built, the church won't last. Uh, every, every community has, has uh, periods of time where one church rises up and it's the cool church and then it kind of fades away. Then a new church comes up, oh, they're the cool church. And, and it usually has to do with, oh, they have cool music or they have cool preacher and he has tattoos and skinny jeans and, and you don't want to do that here. Uh, yeah, no, 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 yeah, we don't want to go there. Um, uh, that would drive people away. <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, oh, have, they have the cool programs and they have blimps and you know, whatever. Um, and, and it's like, if, but... They only last a while if they're solid relationships and aren't built. On any, in any church, that, that's the case. And so our focus is not becoming the next mega church. Our church, our, our focus is, uh, do you know Jesus Christ? And hey, do you want to make this home? And, and every, whatever else, else happens, happens. We, we're just not going to worry about it. We just want to be solid in, in those areas. Um, so it, it's important that we uh, intentionally uh, develop relationships. Because we could just pour a whole bunch of money and, and, and just bring in a crowd. Uh, and I don't know if that does anything other than it makes us the cool church for a while. Uh, we intentionally never did that. Um, we're, we're trying to build steady and slow and, and, and with relationships. A, a few years ago, someone uh, wrote, or I don't know if I heard, I can't remember if I read it or heard it, but they compared relationships that people have 
uh, to three different levels of relationships to rooms in a house. And I remember it's, it stuck with me all these years, so I remember what it said, but I don't remember who said it. It's not my idea. I didn't come up with it, so I can't give them proper credit, so I'm just saying somebody out there did this, uh, and yeah, there must be really smart. Uh, I do like what it said because uh, it, it's, it's pretty simple, and we really used uh, these principles to, to design a lot of the ministry and, and, and programming that we do here at Pathway based on this idea. Uh, the first level of relationships they identified is the, the doorstep relationship. The doorstep uh, is a place uh, of, of introduction, right? It, it's a place you don't know the person who's on the outside. They're just some creepy guy. They're just a stranger who came up and they knocked on your door. Uh, it's where you talk to strangers, where you kind of vet them a little bit to see, do I trust you enough to invite you in? Do I know, I mean, do I know why you're even here? Um, when I was a teenager, I used to deliver newspapers, and this is me as a teenager. It's weird. I haven't aged a bit. Um, <laughs> I, I, I delivered the newspaper, and back then, uh, you had to go door to door to all of your subscribers and collect, collect money. And so I'd come up with my little, little collection thing, and I'd ring the doorbell, and, and uh, if a child came and opened the door, they'd be like, Ugh, it's the paper boy, you know, because they were hoping it was, I don't know, a present or a friend or whatever. And if a, a, an adult opened the door, they'd see me and they'd go like, Ugh, you know, I was like, I'm going to pay you money. And no one wanted to see me, right? I mean, no one was all like, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Come on in, have cookies. You know, it was, it was none of that. It was like, you stay there and I'm going to go get some money, maybe, or I'm going to come back and say, oh, I'm all out. Come back next week, which I was really happy to hear. Um, and, you know, but, but that's, that's where you put people who are in, I, they didn't know my name. They, they, I didn't, they didn't even, they didn't know, they weren't awake usually when I delivered the the newspaper was early, uh, and I'd you know, drop it neatly exactly where they wanted it and everything, but they didn't know who I was. They had no idea, so there was no relationship a- at all. Um, so, so I bet a good, a good 98% of the people kept me out on the doorstep, even if it was raining or cold or whatever. They didn't care because I was just some creepy kid uh, there wanting money from them. There's generally three reasons you keep people on the doorstep of your house, but also of your relationships, right? Uh, one is, is the house is messy. They don't want you to see it, yeah, right? That you, you're just, you're just think, you just want people to assume you live really clean. They don't want you to come in and see dust bunnies and stuff pile up on the table and whatever, the dishes in, in the sink. We'll do that with people, too. I want you to assume I have my life all together. I'm not messy, nothing's going on, so I won't let you too far in. I'll keep you... Uh, at a distance until I feel like I can trust you to tell you my deeper things. So we'll keep people uh, off at bay on on the doorstep. Uh, Another reason is they don't know if they like you or not. That's fair. I don't know you, so maybe I don't don't even like you. I mean, I'm going to keep you out on the doorstep so I can kind of vet you a little bit, kind of figure out, are you here to rob me? Are you here to sell me something? Are you here because you care about me? Are you here because you really only care about you? I mean, what's going on? Uh, the longer I was a, a paper boy, the, the more homes I started getting invited to because I just kept coming back, you know, month after month, whatever long, I remember it was a week, month, must have been once a month. And, and, and they got to know me. They're like, oh, it's this guy. Come on in. You know, here's a cookie. And I was like, oh, we're, not, we're friends, you know. Uh, but, but the initial stage was definitely on the, the doorstep. And, and a third, did I say three? The, thir- the third reason is they just don't like you. Maybe they don't like the way I delivered the newspaper. <laughs> They keep saying, I want it in the milk box, and you never put it there. I don't like you. Uh, there was one person, I may have gone through a phase where I thought it'd be cool to throw the, the papers from my bicycle, and it did include breaking someone's window. Um, that was fun. Uh, they never invited me in. <laughs> so they're already like, no, you've already destructed her. You know, you destroyed our property. We don't want you in here. I know I don't want you in here. We'll do that with people, too. There are some people you might just not like. You don't want to hang around them. You can't wait till they leave. You just keep them uncomfortable, and they'll just go away. That, that, that's just life. So, sometimes it happens. We're keeping people on, on the doorstep. Over the years, we have had, uh, I can say, thousands of people who have been on the doorstep of, of Pathway Church. Um, I, I was kind of revisiting old software. I wasn't actually looking at software, just rethinking uh, of the software uh, a few weeks ago uh, of the original database that we had. And I, I remember we got up well over 2,000 families that had been entered in it. Um, now, a lot of them moved, but a lot of them just said, nah, I don't think so. 
You know, I mean, and that's fine. We're not for everybody. Uh, some people come to the doorstep and say, "I don't know if I want to come in. Um, I don't like the music. Don't like the preacher. Don't like the programming. But, you know, whatever. There's something. That, you know, uh, I'm shopping. It doesn't fit my list. Okay, well, that, that, that's fair. That, that's fair. That doesn't happen. Um, but um, there were several who did. Uh, I know there were well over a thousand who came in further. Uh, became active and involved and engaged, and then later on moved away. Uh, that type of thing. That, that happens. That happens too. That's just reality. I, I, I read a statistic once uh, a while back that said the average church so doesn't like just a pathway thing or or just a Iowa thing, whatever. The average church nationwide. Only 4%, 4% of the people who come to the doorstep in relationship to a church ever actually come in. They, they'll check it out once or twice or three times, whatever, and, and, and whatever it is they're looking for mentally, they, they, they move on. That, that a year later, only 4% are left in, in, any, in any church out there. Now, some of that could be the church does things poorly. They don't assimilate well. They don't have a plan. They just kind of hope things happen. Nobody has conversations. Nobody talks to anybody. Or it could be, like I said, it's just not a good fit. That's, that's real. That's, that's, we're not for everybody. No church is for everybody. Uh, it's just the way it is. But still, 4% is pretty dismal. Uh, it's kind of, kind of embarrassing. Um, and I'm glad it's not just, that's our statistic. That's like every church statistic. There's like these people that do statistics that I was at a conference. They were talking about this uh, one, one day. But, but, but looking at that is why we created a number of uh, front step uh, doorways to come inside. We, we set up things intentionally. Um, not because, hey, I heard this other church did something, that sounds cool, but actually to do purposeful things. It's why we created uh, the cafe. It wasn't because we were hoping to spend money on donuts and, and beverages and things. It was because we wanted a place where people could have conversations that, that, that weren't intimidating. You know, you could say, you could sit down with a stranger and say, hey, I like the chocolate donuts. And they'd be like, well, yeah, huh, I like the maple donuts. Brandon will arm wrestle you over what kind of donut you know you like, but that, but that's okay. It, it's a, it's a it's an entry level kind of conversation. You're, you're not getting into a, hey, can I tell you the three top secret sins in my life? They're like no no, that's not really. I'm I just want a donut, you know. Um, so it's a, an entry level type conversation. The whole point is you can have all kinds of conversations about whatever's whatever you want. Could be fringe, it could be uh, shallow, it could be the weather, could, you know, or uh, as you get to know people, that can also go deeper in the cafe too, but it's a, it's a starting point that is specifically the person for that, uh, the purpose for that. So if you ever see a person sitting alone, uh, at least go say hi. Don't, you don't have to sit down and say, I'd like to be your best friend, because that takes time. You can at least say, well, hello, my name is Dan, uh, glad to meet you. And, and move on, see how you can go, you can gauge from there. Maybe they want to be alone, that's okay too, that's fair. Um, but, but the purpose of it is for us to, to create relationships, to, to say hello to people, to know someone. So, so that's your part. Uh, for anybody who comes next week, if you see them sitting alone, at least say hello. That, that, that's, this is not an not a, you know, awful thing to do. It, it's an entry level type thing. Uh, the Sunday morning worship is designed uh, with that type of opportunity as well. Uh, a family can come in here and, and, and check us out and feel safe. They don't have to sign a lifetime commitment before they leave. We're not selling uh, land or anything or, or you know, we're not timeshares. You know, we're just like, just come in, hang out. If you like us, come back. And, and, and if you want to know more, hey, you usually send them an email or something. If I, have, if I get their information, um, yeah, the, the, I'll answer anything you want. Let's have a conversation. If they don't, that's fine too. Sometimes they'll come three or four weeks and never even tell us anything. We don't know who they are. Um, so I have no way to contact them. But that, that's up to that person and their, their comfort uh, level. But uh, Sunday morning is a time you can have uh, engage in uh, pretty light conversations. Have you ever again been in a super deep conversation on a Sunday morning? I mean, it's possible, but generally speaking, it's, this, this isn't set up for that. We're facing each other's back of our heads. We're looking up here. We're singing. We're you know we're doing that kind of thing. Um, but it's, so it's an entry level type thing, relationship wise. We also have fellowship uh, events periodically where you can come and get to know people in, in an unthreatening way. We have our annual Uno tournament. We have potluck dinners and parties and things like that. COVID really messed that up, and, and now we're trying to get that uh, rhythm going again. And the people leading that have the family members with some health issues, so so it's kind of slowed things down. But we kind of we got to get that ramped up here again, uh, simply for opportunities to build relationships because they're critical to the church. Uh, they're critical to the church. So that's the doorstep uh, relationship. The next, next stage is the living room relationships. 
this is a, a place where you, you, you know them a little better. Maybe they're your friends. Uh, maybe they're a uh, little more than acquaintances, but at least you kind of know who they are. Maybe they're colleagues of some sort. You like each other enough, you don't mind hanging out. Uh, the living room is a place of a, a little deeper connection, but it's still a little bit formal. I mean, it's still like you're sitting, you know, it's, yeah, except for the guy who looks really relaxed. Um, uh, <laughs> He's like, I'm ready to move on. And, and they're like, well, it's nice and proper. You, you know. and, uh, so it's kind of a mixed bag, the, the typical living room uh, is type, type setting. Uh, small groups are, are what that is designed to, to reach, it, it, to, to address. It's a place where you can come and, and uh, your comfort level can, whatever you're comfortable with, you can be silent in the group and, and give a few weeks before you speak. Or you can be the person who gets just starts talking, you know, it, it's a safe place for a small handful of people that, to communicate, get to know one another, know things about each other. Uh, it's all about building the relationship uh, and, and, and building some scriptural knowledge just too, but it, it's really geared toward, toward relationships. Uh, uh, service events that we do uh, are about being obedient to Christ and serving those around us, but it's also about getting to know one another because when you're serving with someone, you get to know them, you have conversations, um, we do all kinds of little events where they're, they're an opportunity uh, for you to biblically help people and biblically get to know one another. So it, it's, it's a dual purpose. When you're like grilling food or serving food to someone, the conversation by nature has to go beyond, I like the chocolate donuts. He's like, yeah, but you're burning that burger. You know, so, um, you, know, that's good. you know, you have a conversation well, that's about how you're going to accomplish the task. How do we organize this? How do we serve people? You do this, you do that. And you get some conversation going on. A relationship is being built through all those little tiny conversations that are happening. And sometimes that even overflows into your personal life. I burned this burger. Uh, it reminds me of the time I really got burned by my girlfriend. Or I, I don't know, that probably doesn't happen too often. But the, you, you know, your uh, relationship can build through serving together. They happen, uh, our, our growth in relationship happens through shared experiences in, in the small groups and the service projects. Our very, very, very first small group, uh, before there was a Pathway Church, before we had a name, this is the group that eventually named uh, the, the Pathway, um, we started, and they were a group of strangers, none of us, nobody knew each other. We were, we were, we were put together in this group uh, to, to get something going, and I, I looked around and I thought, I don't have a clue who any of these people are. None of them knew anybody. There was no history together. There, there was, we just happened to show up at the same place at the same time, and uh, we're like, hey, let's do a small group. And everybody's like, okay. And, and so I thought, how do we form, how do we get this group to go beyond the, the doorstep and into the living room? What do we do? And, and I have what I believe to this day was a genius idea. Um, I told First Service, I'll probably write a book someday about this, but I don't know what I'd say. But, but uh, um, I took out my guitar in this small group, and I said, guys, we're gonna sing. And you could see immediately their eyes were like, you've got to be joking me. Like, what? <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, even on Sunday morning, everybody sings just loud enough to not be heard, right? <laughs> right? And I pulled up my guitar and said, no, we're gonna, we're gonna sing some songs. And there's this fright in, in their eyes, and I start playing, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Come on, guys, come on. Gave them little words and everything. And, and they, they squeaked the words out. They hated it. They hated it hated it, right? And I knew it. <laughs> and so we did it the next week, <laughs> and the next week, and the next week. <laughs> I don't know how long we did it. We did it for several weeks. And, and, and the, the, the funny thing is, what I wanted was something that would pull them together, and it did, against me, but I don't care. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I, I got broad shoulders. I don't care if people hate me. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> I, I got a solo next week, don't I? <laughs> and the warm-up band. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it was torture. But you know what would happen? If, if I was upstairs for a few minutes in our, our basement, and, and I was late, I, I, they were down there grumbling. Oh, they sing those stupid songs. And I was like, and like, oh, man, he's got his paper down. He's going to sing stupid songs. And I knew, I knew they were going to. Okay. Now, I didn't do it forever. But what that did is that, that, that pulled that group together a little bit where they had nothing else in common. They had me in common and those dumb songs. And here's what's funny. It was 21 years ago. Uh, they still talk about it. <laughs> 
still talk about it. When, when, when we're at the hospital we're with Rick, and I said, there was a guitar on the wall in the little, little uh, 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 room. <laughs> not, not the his room, but the visitor room. And I was like, Rick, man, we're going we're gonna to sing. And he's he just like, <laughs> he didn't have the strength to fight me. And I said, <laughs> said no. <laughs> No, it was, it, was, it was, and we sung our little sanctuary song, um, and, 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 and several from that small group came, came to the service, and like, that's the thing they all brought up. Oh, that stupid song. I know, I know. But you know what that did is that, that, that pulled, that did, it did help, it pulled us together. It got us immediately out of the front door into the, to the living room where we could have conversations that, that we still talk about now. It's just a joke because I was just, you know, I'm not a good guitar player nor I'm a good singer, but um, uh, we, we had some, some fun with that. So we can't force programs, you know, on you to, to, to make this happen, but it, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, it helps. These, these little experiences that we share to, together help. In living room relationships, you engage in deeper conversation with each other than, than you do at the doorstep. You, you learn people's struggles, you learn their fears, you learn their successes, you learn their joys, you learn what's going on in their life. You're developing these deeper relationships. Some of the classes that we have are designed not only to teach, but also to build relationships upon another. The Getting to Know Pathway Church classes, it's, it's kind of like, hey, we're all in the same spot. None of us know each other. And like, well, let's kind of start this journey together. Together. It's about starting to build some relationships, the growing in the Christian faith class, which is what started, launched that uh, small group in the first place, is a four week class where we talk about some very, very basics, and then it just kept going and became Pathway Church. Uh, we have a Discovering Your Spiritual Gifts class. We did that in June. Uh, that's a six-week thing, but we narrowed it down to one Saturday morning. Um, part of that was all about shared experience. Now we can, hey, what gift do you have? How are you serving? And, and it gave us something to talk about. It builds relationships. So there's a dual purpose to it. Shared experiences where relationships are, are formed. And once you have a number of shared experiences and you keep doing it, you know, sharing experiences together, the bonds start running deeper. That's when you go through the next doorway and the level of friendship, and that's the kitchen table relationship. Uh, this is where uh, the kitchen table uh, is like where family hangs out, right? Or really good friends. You don't invite anybody into your kitchen uh, unless you're like, you're, 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 uh, you're good with them, <laughs> you, you know. Um, the, the, the paper boy doesn't come in and sit down at the kitchen table for a conversation, generally. Uh, this is something you have, have to earn. You, this is where you relax. This is where your defenses are down. This is where you allow yourself to talk freely about what's going on in your world, the hurts, the joys, the pains, the, the sorrow, everything. You can laugh. You can cry. You talk about life. All of that happens at the kitchen table. My, some of my most, to this day, most favorite memorable times of teaching people scripture have been in the kitchen table, literally, of their home where they said, I'm struggling with something with you. Come over, and I come over, and they're like scooting breadcrumbs on. I'm sorry about this. Like, hey, man, don't worry about it. And they go, let's talk about scripture. And we, we get into scriptural issues, and because and, at that point, I don't care that there's breadcrumbs on the table. That's not going to be like, well, I'm not going to talk to you. You know, you got to clean your table before I come over. Um, I'm not worried about if there's dust bunnies. I'm, I don't care if there's a stack of books on the counter or bills over there or what, you know, whatever's going on in the kitchen. I don't care. I'm there to see them and it's a personal, deeper relationship. Uh, you can't force those on people. You can't make it happen. Uh, they just kind of happen. But we do do our best to foster those by giving uh, opportunities. People who've been in the same small group for a long time, year after year after year, shared experiences, they uh, tend to develop these type of, of relationships. Our, our CAP, Christian Accountability Group, uh, where there's usually one or two people talking like accountability, real personal stuff, those develop that kind of relationship because you're talking about things that you wouldn't tell people normally, you know, and, and I've given someone permission to say, hey, uh, what's going on really in, in your life? And, and there's a, it's a, usually no, long, no bigger than three people. Uh, so there's a really close-knit group that's formed through the, the Christian Accountability Groups uh, that we have. Uh, these are the people, your, your kitchen table people, are the people that show up for you when you're in the hospital. They're the ones who show up for you when you lose your job. They're the ones who you go to for advice and for counsel when you're struggling. You just need someone to, to, to cry with or the, to, to laugh with or to, to whatever. They're, they're the ones you go to. They're the closest in your life. You've developed that level of trust. It's the kind of relationship I think about when I read First Peter 122, when he says to love one another deeply from the heart. 
I mean, I'd like to say, oh, come on, church, you all love each other deeply. You're like, okay, I, I don't even know what that means. Well, you do when you love someone deeply, but it's hard to, you know, I'll, I'll guarantee you the whole 3,120 people didn't love each other deeply. They loved each other, and they did a lot of things, but there were groups within that 3,000 that, that began to love each one another deeply from the heart. That's the story. That's the goal, is we want to have relationships like that in our life where we have that type of, of bond together. Again, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen accidentally. It takes some intentionality. It takes some work. It takes effort. It takes lots of little tiny shared experiences and lots of giving trust and taking trust and going back and forth to the point where you're like, I, can tell, I, I believe I can tell you anything. Um, that's not true with everybody, but I think I can tell you anything. Our, uh, our, our trip to, to Zimbabwe this year, I observed something I hadn't observed before, maybe because I don't know why it was on my mind, but it, but it was. We went to three different churches um, to do revivals. We went to the first church we went to was the first church that they had ever started, uh, this ministry. So it was in decades old. It was in the 50s sometime, 1950s. Uh, so they've been around together for a long time. Uh, they, they, generations have come and gone in that church. You know, in Africa, you know, you, you're living in an area like you're there your entire life for the most part, and, and that's where you are born, and that's where you die, and, and that's where you live. So these are families that have known each other for a long, long, long time. Uh, the last church we went to was the church we planted three years ago. So and this is in a newer community. Uh, so these are people who didn't know each other as well. Uh, the other one, I don't know when it was started, but it's somewhere obviously between the two. This is the newest, and that's the oldest church. And, and uh, again, it just dawned on me somewhere in our visit how they interacted together was fascinating to me. There's a lot of dancing that takes place. Is there going to be dancing next week? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of dancing and, and hooting and, and shouting and and praise, <laughs> and it's so cool. Uh, and here's the thing, uh, the first church, they've been together for decades, they knew each other's dance moves. I mean, they could anticipate. If you've ever been to like a high school jazz band, I don't know if it does in another place, like a high school jazz band concert. Uh, we used to do that with the kids, we were in, you know, doing that. And, and uh, like one of the instruments will have a solo and everybody kind of backs off, they're, you know, they're doing their thing. And, and uh, that was my bass clarinet, uh, but alto bass. Um, no, that was alto sax, sorry. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> And then another one will come forward, and you know, and it's, they all take their turn doing things. There's lots of little solos. Well, think of that in dancing in a worship service uh, in Africa. And well, you saw me with my moves there. I had to look at my feet because I had to watch the guy's feet next to me, you know, doing his thing. Uh, because they have the different little foot moves and the leg moves, and they do the arm thing. They do all this stuff. And and in the church that had been around the longest. Like some guy would come and he'd start a thing and they'd all jump in and they'd do the exact same thing. It was almost like a flash mob thing that they'd been rehearsing for like, they, they were all in line. I'm like, how do these guys, like, whoa. Because it makes it look so easy. And I'd go up there and I'm, you know, trying to not trip. Uh, so I obviously did not mix in well with what that group was doing, but they've been doing it their whole lives. <laughs> yeah. they, they knew when, when, when this guy was going to go left and that guy was going to go right, they, they, they just knew it. The church that was only three years old there was joy and, and celebration and love and everything there too. They just didn't have the depth in relationships. So they didn't have the moments of, of everybody doing the same thing. I mean, they kind of tried, but it'd be like, you know, me jumping in. I don't know what you're doing. I'm just, hey, I got to watch your feet, you know. They didn't have to wash their feet. They knew what was going on. Anyway, the, the whole thing is their relationships were, were all kitchen relationships. Many of them lived with, with just a you could see their homes from the church building, you know, where we were at. I mean, some came from distances, but uh, it was just kind of cool. It was, it was because their relationships are so, so deep and, and so meaningful. Um, we're going to see that in these, the text as we move forward in Acts, of the church moving together in ways that were amazing, selling property and helping one another and serving one another and loving people in, in crazy ways. So it's possible to develop. There was also some supernatural things going on there in that first century. Uh, guess what? We're a church. There's supernatural things going on here too, correct? <laughs> So we can attain these type of relationships if we engage, if we um, are involved, if we uh, pray about it as well and ask for God's guidance because there were things happening. Even though 3,000 people were added to their number in one day, they went from front porch to living room to kitchen like 
bang, super quick. And, and then it kept growing it exponentially. Thing, thing, the church in the early days was growing like crazy. The main thing for us today is, is, is that the first generation disciples added to their numbers, and that means they were part of them. It wasn't like, well, we're going to keep you on the doorstep for a while until I see, decide if I like you. We, they, they let them on in. They were in. I don't care if you've been here an hour or six months or 10 years or if you were part of that original small group that were in my basement. We're all the same. We're all added to the same number, the same place. And, 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 and they were thriving in their faith uh, together. They didn't stay on the fringe. They didn't try to work their faith out on their own as individuals. I got this. I don't need you guys. They didn't do that. They lived out their faith in community together. Church for them was not just a Sunday morning experience that they did. It was, it was their life. It's how they lived. It's how they breathed. Uh, it's how they were. It was living out their faith, meeting with people, praying with people, serving with people, caring for people. I just, guess I just, just want to let you know the door is open. <laughs> the door is open. Uh, we invite you in wherever you're at. I, I invite you to take the next step. Maybe you purposely kept out on the the front door for a while. Like I'm still checking. I get it. That's okay. Come on into the living room. There's there's we, we we got a few couches, but we'd love to have you. Or you've been there for a while. You think, man, maybe it's time for me to go in a di- di- deeper. Uh, there's plenty of room around the kitchen table. There's room. For, for more and more. You know what? If we add 3,000 next week, we'll take them all. <laughs> you know, we'll let God worry about that. We'll let him worry about the numbers. We're just going to worry about connecting with people and building relationships uh, together. Some people will shoot right through those doors, and it's, it's fun to watch that. Some people take time. That's okay, too, wherever you're at. But I encourage you to engage in the tools that are available. If you're like, I want to know people, but I don't know how to know people. Well, hang out in the cafe and talk. Hang out after church and talk. Uh, you know, start engaging. Come to, come to the uh, meals that we do, the, the, the grilling we do, that we have a car show this Friday night. Just come hang out. I mean, that's all you got to do. And, and, and you start sharing experiences uh, together. Uh, that's how we become a family. I like that first generation church. 